Morning San Antonio starts right now. And a good morning to you. It is Friday, September 30th. I know tomorrow is going to be October 1st. We're almost done with September. But first, we're going to check in with Justin in a couple minutes. New information about a major crash that tied up traffic most of the morning. Let's get right to that. Please say it was a hit and run caused uh, traffic to back up on for miles on Interstate 37 northbound near Loop 410 earlier this morning on the southeast side. They say a man was working on his vehicle on the side of the road when he was hit by a woman driving by. The man died after he was hit. So thanks to the people who witnessed the crash, police were able to track down the driver and arrest her. Police say she is a 26 year old woman and she will be charged with failure to stop and render aid. This all started around four in the morning. The highway wasn't cleared until seven this morning. Right now we want to take you to Transkind and we've spotted an incident closer to downtown and I believe this is yeah, I 10 at Frio. This is reported as a minor collision, but it looks like we've got a couple of lanes blocked off. This call just came out about 10 minutes ago, so things are just now developing. Looks like we've got a hero truck and SAPD out there on the scene, but look at the backups already wow. coming off the, uh, looks like those uh, that one s split there where the lanes of I-10 merge heading towards the downtown area. Again, this is eastbound 10 right around the Frio area. Lots of road issues this morning, hopefully clearing up as the morning goes on. Uh, Justin, it's been, it was nice outside. I, I was telling Mark earlier, I like using like the photographers or the field team in the morning yeah. as you know, a gauge of how cold it is. And one of them was wearing a jacket this morning. There were some jackets out right. there. It's been, it's been that kind of week. And as we head into October, we would hope things will get a little bit cooler and We'll have some nice mornings still coming up. Let's first start with uh, some weather headlines here. And as we uh, take a look at the time lapse, uh, we do have clear skies again today to start. And uh, we'll see sunny skies all day long. We're going to talk about Hurricane Ian here in just a second. We're also going to discuss Tropical Storm Orlean. That's in the Pacific. That brings some changes for us late in the weekend and into early next week. We've also been compiling some stats about how dry it's been here in 2022, and the numbers are pretty astounding. We'll bring that to you here in just a little bit. Right now, 67 degrees outside, dew point is at 52, east northeasterly winds at 6. And the case at 12 hour forecast, 83 degrees, noontime, sunny skies. We're up around 90 degrees. That's basically how it's been all week long with those clear skies and light winds. So good for Friday night football tonight. We've also got to talk about Ian. Where is it at right now? It's back to being a hurricane, by the way, as Mike has been telling you through the morning hours. And as uh, we look at the latest stats, winds are at 85 miles per hour, gusting to 105. This is going to bring some storm surge to places like Charleston, four to seven feet, in fact. That will cause more damage. And as this work, it works inland, it will also bring some very, very heavy rain across the Carolinas, two to six inches of rain. So we know where it's headed. And we've also known what it's done to places like Florida. ABC's Justin Finch explains some of the damage there that's going on in Florida. Good morning. Progress on the ground at Tropicana Field, where trucks are leaving now to head off to restore power across southwestern Florida. Millions still waking up in the dark this morning. Recovery now beginning as search and rescue efforts are racing against time. Destruction as far as the eye can see. Southwest Florida in shambles after Hurricane Ian roared ashore, lashing the area with near Category 5 storm strength. We watched things starting to fly. Uh, Lynn and I went off. Part of the roof went off. The rest of the roof went off. The walls caved in. The difficult search for survivors underway. These are very challenging circumstances for our rescuers, very dangerous circumstances. They're dealing with high water, uh, you know, cities that don't look like cities anymore. ABC's Victor Okendo with the Cajun Navy, this mother and daughter rescued from the top of their car. Three hours watching the water rise. What was that like? Scared to death. Scared to death. I thought I was going to die right there. This could be the deadliest hurricane in Florida's history. President Biden warning the number of deaths from the storm is likely to rise significantly. The impacts of this storm are, are historic and the damage that was done uh, has been historic. The Southwest Florida landscape transformed. The U.S. Coast Guard surveying the damage from above. 
barreling east over central Florida, a weakened Ian brought heavy rain plus storm surges. ABC's Trevor Alt on the impact. It led to significant flooding in places like St. Augustine. It led to water rescues in Daytona Beach. The eastern shores of Florida, Georgia and the Carolinas on high alert as Ian now moves north on track for a second landfall as a category one hurricane in South Carolina. Justin Finch, ABC News, St. Petersburg. Hey, we will be hosting a phone bank in partnership with the Red Cross to raise money for relief efforts in Florida. The phone lines will be open from noon to 7 p.m. on Monday and we will release the phone number to call on that day. Mark, Sarah. Justin, thank you. Police are investigating a shooting at a Valero last night on San Pedro, not far from ISIM. It happened just before 10 o'clock last night. So police say a man walked into the store acting like a customer reaching for his wallet, but pulled out a gun instead. When the clerk saw the gun, he pulled out his own gun and shot the man. The man fell down and tried to reach for his gun again, but the clerk shot him a second time. EMS tried to save the man's life, but he ended up dying. The clerk was not hurt. Let's take a look at today's 9 at 9. Russian President Vladimir Putin is expected to officially annex four regions of Ukraine today. It would total about 15 percent of Ukraine's territory. Russia says an attack on those areas would be an attack on Russia. The U.S. and allies have promised to impose even more sanctions against Russia in a show of support for Ukraine. The House is expected to vote today to approve a bill to fund the government through December 16th. The bill has already gotten approval from the Senate. Once the House has passed the bill, it will go to President Biden to sign. Right now, government funding is expected to end at midnight today. Lawmakers say they are confident there will not be a government shutdown. The wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas met with the January 6th committee for more than four hours yesterday. The panel wanted to know about text messages she had sent before the Capitol attack happened. Sources say Jenny Thomas told the committee she keeps her politics separate from her husband's work. And she also reiterated that she believed the 2020 presidential election was stolen. CDC officials say some cases of monkeypox are more severe than originally thought. They say some people with the disease have experienced debilitating symptoms like painful lesions that could lead to amputations. Most of these severe cases are being seen in people who also have advanced stages of HIV. With that said, the majority of cases in the U.S. have been mild to moderate. The ice bucket challenge that swept social media in 2014 has partially funded a study that led to the approval of a new therapy for ALS. The drug has been shown to slow down paralysis caused by Lou Gehrig's disease. Two college students came up with the medication about 10 years ago. About 30,000 people in the U.S. are battling ALS. The president's plan to cancel student loan debt will cost about $30 billion a year over the next decade. That's about $379 billion over the course of the program, which is roughly the same as what the Congressional Budget Office's analysts has showed. The first wave of student loan forgiveness is expected to roll out in October. First time unemployment claims are down again across the country. 193,000 people filed for unemployment help, which is down 16,000 from the week before. That's the lowest since late April and well below the 218,000 a week average before the pandemic. Tonight is the debate between Governor Greg Abbott and Democratic opponent Beto O'Rourke. Begins at 7 p.m. and you can watch it right here on KSAT or online at KSAT.com. Steve Spreester is one of the panelists for the debate. Abbott's campaign says this will be the only debate he will be doing before Election Day on November 8th. Donations have been strong in the past few weeks for Hunger Action Month. Today is your last day to donate non-perishable foods to any participating RBFCU location for our KSAC Community Food Drive. Donations will be accepted until 5 p.m. You can find more information on ksat.com. And that's today's 9 at 9. And your other morning headlines, a former Dallas Cowboys player is killed in a rock climbing incident. And a cross-country team from California is a cut above their competition. Plus, the Hollywood sign is getting a makeover with its own paint color. David Sears is here, and he's 
also going to give us a brief history lesson on the Hollywood sign. Got a couple of things homework, you, buddy. you might want to know about the Hollywood sign. Have you ever seen the Hollywood sign, like up close and personal? No. I, I can't remember if I have or not. You can only get so close to the Hollywood sign. Found that out. I don't know. You've been teasing this information in the newsroom all morning. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have it for you in just a second, but first, the search was from the air and the ground to find former cowboy Gavin Escobar when searchers reached him and a female climbing partner. They unfortunately were dead, the result of a rock climbing incident. Escobar was a tight end for the Cowboys from 2013 to 2016. A woman, 33-year-old Chelsea Walsh, also died. The two were found in a remote area of the San Bernardino Forest where they were climbing a rock face. They were spotted by a couple of witnesses who called 911. By the time firefighters reached the two climbers, it was too late. After leaving the Cowboys, Escobar went on to play for the Baltimore Ravens before retiring. He was a firefighter in Long Beach, California after he retired. Several of his former Cowboys tweeted their reaction, like Des Bryant, who simply tweeted, Wow, R.I.P. Gavin Escobar. His mother told WFA-TV in Dallas that he was a great father, husband, and son, just heartbroken. Escobar was 31 years old. The Santa Clara's men's cross-country team may not be good at cross country and maybe doesn't really matter for this story because they've gone viral and it's all about their team photos. Their look is actually a tradition for team bonding. They all do the work themselves and of course, running or not, as we said, they are all, check out those mustaches <laughs> and some of that hair. Yeah, they're all cut above. That's probably why they do it themselves. It is in one of the most iconic fixtures in the U.S. It's the Hollywood sign. And like a lot of the Hollywood folks, even the sign needs a makeover. It gets a facelift every 10 years. Workers have already cleaned it up. They've washed it, got the rust off. Now they will slap on 400 gallons of primer and paint. They should be finished by mid-October. The sign even has its own paint color. The last time that we painted the sign was in 2012 and paint lasts about 10 years. The Hollywood sign is just not a symbol of a place. It's a symbol of, a in, of an industry, the entertainment industry. They named a special paint after us. Yeah, it's called Ho uh, Hollywood Sign Centennial White. It's so freaking awesome. That's something everybody wants to see. Yep, we came all we came the way from the East to Coast see to see this. Picture. And it was well worth it. There you go. It's just freaking awesome, isn't it? Okay, so next year, the sign will celebrate its centennial. That's why it gets its own centennial white paint color. Mm -hmm. Now, according to Wikipedia, did a little research. The original sign was put up back in 1923. The original sign actually said Hollywood Land because developers wanted to advertise their new neighborhood right below that hill. It had like 4,000 lights on it. And the lights would blink and flash so they could advertise their little neighborhood. Unfortunately, it was falling apart. The H was gone. Locals called it an eyesore, so the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce got it repaired. But they had to take off the word land, so it just became Hollywood. Because I think the, the Chamber of Commerce there got, got L.A. to help them out with the repairs. Right. So they said, well, you, you take off the land and you've got Hollywood, and we'll, we'll keep it that. I've seen so, pictures of when go. it was in such a sad state. It yeah. was pretty bad for a while. There. Well, they had to redo it again in the 70s, mm -hmm. because I think when they did it in the 40s, it was like wooden, didn't hold up very well. So they redid it in the 70s. Yeah. And there you go. So, so now you got And the you've seen it a couple times, right? Yeah, we've been, not, we've been able to drive below it. It's like real hard to get to. They, yeah. they kind of limit you on, on, on how you can Access. get up there and get close to it. Sure. But those letters are like 44 feet tall. Deceivingly. So they're, they're, they're so. pretty big. They need an LED light upgrade. I think that's the next one. You think so? Right. Maybe in 10 years. All right, we'll David Sears, thank you. 9 11, 68 degrees. Tiffany Huertas joins us now with a look at what she has coming up next. Good morning, Tiffany. Good morning. A group of Latina middle school students are spreading their culture through a new club. A look at the different projects they're working on next. It is Hispanic Heritage Month and a local school has a new club where Latina students celebrate their culture and discuss topics impacting the Latino community. Tiffany Huertas joins us from KIPP Aspire Academy where students are embracing their culture. Good morning, Tiffany. Happy Friday. 
Good morning. Happy Friday. I am so excited to do the story because I am also a proud Latina. And these girls are so amazing. They do so much great work here at the school. They've done different projects, including making sure students here at the school know about different cultures and just get involved and learn a little bit more of the different places they come from to talk a little bit more about this. We have all the students that want to share more about this, and we have the leaders part of this group. Good morning. Talk to us about how this club started. Yes, so um, seeing that 90% of our population was Latin Latinx and female, we wanted to give the girls a safe space where they could like discover a little bit more about their identity, feel secure, and just like feel empowered and embrace their Latinx culture. So that's why we created this club. Omaris, talk to us about the different issues you all talk about. So we talk about uh, being a feminist, machism in our culture, and we also talk about different struggles in our Latin culture, but we also talk about uh, embracing our culture and different cultures in our community. And talk to us about this shirt. This is the shirt part of the club? Yeah, so we wanted to have like something that they can identify as what, with in, in the school. Like when you see somebody walking, like, hey, she's a pralatina. And we created this um, logo, and then we decided to make shirts. And it was a, like, a success because everybody was wearing the shirts. And then even people that were not from the club or were not from the Latinx community and teachers, they're like, hey, I want to like, get a shirt. Where can we buy it? Can we get it? And we we're like, I mean, we can create shirts that say we are supporters of pralatinas, right? So um, that's what we were thinking of. But this is like the shirt that we identify. If you see us, we're a proud Latina. So <laughs> cute. And talk to us about what's your favorite part about being a proud Latina? My favorite part about being a proud Latina is just being able to look up to the eighth graders and being in our safe space and just being able to learn about our Latinx heritage. So awesome. And what cool projects are you all working on this year? This year we are doing an altar. Um, we did one last year, and it's like when kids get their like loved ones, past ones um, that died, they get to put them on the altar, and they get to, like sometimes they can bring little foods, and if like people don't have like a picture of them, they could always write their name on a little candle and light it up, or like the little fake candles, they can light it up right there and put it on the altar. Well, all of this is amazing. They're going to be part of Day of the Dead, and we will be there as well. So I'm excited to see the altar you all make. You're making all the Latinas out there very proud. Thanks for joining us this morning. We're going to have more of this story coming up on the Noon Show. Back to you in the studio. Thank you, Taff. Let's go outside with live cam on your Friday morning. Very mild out there right now, 68 degrees. Very pleasant, lots of sunshine. Looking to be a great night for high school football. But as Justin joins us now, we definitely can put 2022 down in the record books. Well, so far, we'll see how it ends, but I have a bad feeling that it's going to end on a very dry note, and we know how bad this year has been so far. So let me update you on some of the statistics that we have now. So as you look at the year to date, so January 1st to yesterday, and you go back through all the records, all the way back through 1886, this is the driest year to date we've seen on record. Only 8.20 inches of rain so far this year, and the average is 24.44. So we are more than 16 inches below average when it comes to rainfall. And you look back at the other years, next in line is 1917. So they had 8.88 inches at this point in the year. And then you see so on 1954, 2011, 1925. All of these are big time drought years. And 2022 is probably going to fall in that category, at least here around San Antonio and New Braunfels, where it has been the driest. Uh, and we look at the aquifer, it's suffering too. It's down to 630.7. That's the latest number this morning. The average is up above 660, so we're down 30 feet from where the average is. And we're still in stage two watering with saws. That probably won't change, but the drought's taking its toll in the aquifer. The 10-day rolling average is 632.1. As we go outside for you, it is nice, so at least there's that. We've got clear skies and temperatures 67 degrees. Dew point is at 52. East northeast chilly winds at about six. And we're in the 60s for much of the area right now. You'll see some 70s starting to pop up by next hour. It is already 75 in Criso Springs and 70 in Catula. But around Bear County, still in the upper 60s. And again, as Mark said, for this evening for Friday Night Football, it looks great. It, you look at the dew points, and they really stay dry. Even going into next week, by Thursday, trying to rise a little bit, maybe up into the 50s, but nothing that 
tells us there's a significant amount of moisture moving in that will give us any sort of rain chance. So the case had 12 hour forecast 86 at 1 o'clock. We're around at 90 by 4 p.m. 90 by 5 p.m. Clear skies and that goes right on into this evening. So any Friday night plans you have looks great. Uh, certainly not great as you get uh, over into the South Carolina as uh, Hurricane Yen is starting to get a little bit closer to landfall here. Right now winds are at 85 miles per hour, gusting to 105. So this is a Category 1 storm, and this should be probably making landfall just after lunch. Storm surge is going to be 4 to 7 feet, so that's pretty significant considering most of South Carolina here is low lying and a lot of that water is going to surge in. Uh, then it works its way up into parts of North Carolina, weakening as it does, but still producing a lot of heavy rain. We think that on the order of two to six inches of rain. So there will be some flooding here too. North Carolina, Charleston, Raleigh over to Charlotte here uh, through the weekend. And that is on top, of course, of what have, has already taken place there in Florida. Uh, now let's go over to the Pacific. We've got tropical storm Orlean. It is uh, out over the open ocean. Not a big deal right now. Winds are at 60 miles per hour, but it is forecast to make landfall somewhere on the west coast of Mexico. Uh, and what it does for us is it throws some high clouds in our direction. So Sunday into Monday, you're going to see a little bit more high cloudiness. Could be thick from time to time. It just doesn't bring us any rain. That's the frustrating part. Sometimes, especially as we get into October, once we see storms in the Pacific, that'll bring in some moisture and we'll get some rain out of it. This time, it's just clouds. Uh, and that's it because uh, things are just so dry at the surface. So as we look at the forecast here, 89 Saturday, 87 Sunday, we'll get some more clouds uh, Sunday into Monday and then partly cloudy skies next week. Uh, the daytime highs aren't that bad. We're in the 80s. Morning lows are in the 60s. So there's not much to complain about there except for the lack of rain, guys. Uh, Justin, I just planted all my wildflower seeds. Mm -hmm. Fall is a time to plant Texas wildflowers. So I made a new flower bed. Lots of hand watering, though. Yes. Every day yes. because no help from your nature. You're disciplined. You'll make it happen. Yeah. It's, it's also my zen time, too. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> 922, 69 degrees. Okay. Have, speaking of hand watering, have you seen the TikTok trend about switching from traditional grass lawns to clover lawns? Will this work for San Antonio? Why a local ecologist is saying not so fast? And what local ground cover options are even more sustainable? Checking transcoder right now, we have good news. The upper level of I-10 heading into downtown. There was a minor accident there where the lanes come back together on the right side of your screen. That incident has just cleared. And just a heads up, Commerce Street will be fully closed between St. Mary's and Soledad until Sunday. This is because a private developer is dismantling and removing a crane from that street. If the work is done faster than anticipated, we will make sure to update you over the weekend. But again, Commerce Street will be closed between St. Mary's and Soledad until Sunday. With this information and other info about traffic related incidents, scan the QR code on your screen to go to our Traffic Authority webpage for the latest updates. It's 926 and 69 degrees. More ahead in GMSA at 9. Including the start of a spooky season as one air travel, a group of air travelers learned it has already started. <laughs> so those weird noises causing a spooky scare on American Airlines. Fasten your seatbelt because we have that story coming up. Uh Well, the drought and intense heat we've experienced here in South Texas this summer has taken a toll on our lawn, specifically our St. Augustine and Bermuda grasses. But have you seen the viral trend on TikTok that promotes getting rid of grass and switching to clover? I spoke with a native plant expert if this trend works for San Antonio and if not, what are our sustainable options? Yellow patchy grass to no grass at all. It's what a lot of San Antonio lawns look like right now after a brutal summer of drought and record breaking temperatures. And if your lawn is green, it might have taken a lot of watering. Local certified plant expert Crystal Orr with the Garden Center says most lawn grasses aren't native and was a tradition brought over from Europe many years ago where there is more rain and cloud coverage. I think it's like people wanted to you know, they brought that over with them because that's what they were used to seeing there. And then it just became this thing as a status. So are there more sustainable options? You may have seen this viral trend on TikTok that you can see playing on my phone. A call to switch from grass to clover. 
but native plant experts say not so fast. An important thing to do here with this trend is um, put a Texas twist on it. Use our local or Texas native species. Lee Marlowe is the sustainable landscape ecologist for the San Antonio River Authority. She says clover isn't native to South Texas and won't stay lush and green year round like these TikTok videos are showing. Instead, she says there are several native ground cover options. For example, frog fruit. It can grow in shade or full sun, requires little water, and pollinators love it. If you want something that looks like grass, Marlowe says you can use Weberville sedge that stays lush even through the winter months. Snake herb is another stunner that stays low to the ground and blooms beautiful purple flowers for pollinators. Another option, she says, that can be sustainable for ground cover is native to San Antonio. I actually found it in my yard. It is called straggler daisy. It is heat and drought tolerant, produces little yellow flowers, which pollinators love. And I haven't watered it much. And you can see it's doing way better than the Bermuda grass in my yard. Going native will also cut back on your time and spending. If you plant native in your yard, it will reduce your cost 20 to 50%. That includes water, pest spray, fertilizer, which all those things are really bad for the environment. Most importantly, Marlowe says planting native supports our local ecosystems fight against habitat loss and climate change. And there are a lot of uh, critters that depend on these native plants. And there's a huge concern globally about the loss of biodiversity. She says planting native provides food and shelter for bees, butterflies and birds. So if you want some of these ground covers going mm -hmm. to your local nursery, some have them, but the problem is like things like that frog fruit or that snake herb, you're not gonna find them growing at your local nurseries. You're gonna have to get the seeds for them. Okay. And so there's several- A long-term project. Yes, and yeah. so on ksat.com, I have the link of where uh, it's called Native American Seed mm -hmm. Company, and they're based here out of San Antonio, and I have that link um, on ksat.com where you can get those seeds. And all, and all transparency, I thought she said strangler daisy. You said straggler daisy. It is called straggler daisy. Uh -huh. Some people think it's a weed and they spray fertilizer on it. Do and try to kill it. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. You don't, you don't need, you don't need any of the pesticides. Okay. Just embrace, embrace the native. Got it. And correction noted. All right, let's go outside with live cam on this Friday. <laughs> What's going on, Chuckles? Uh, not too much. You know, I was out working in the yard a couple days ago, and I got enveloped in a cloud of snap-nosed butterflies. They're, they're really coming back just out. Just one like, with nature, Justin Horn. Wait, 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 wait back nature. up. Did you call them snot-nosed or snout-nosed? Snout-nosed. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just to be clear. You were hearing all kinds of words this morning, I don't Mark. know. I need to go home at some we're point. We're going to get Mark's hearing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me show you a picture here on our case to connect. I love these two pups. This is Kona and Alexa, and they're waiting for uh, for me to throw the ball so they can jump into the pool. That's from the person who took the picture there. Uh, they're patient, right? I mean, they're just just waiting. And the looks on their faces, that's the best part. Uh, we love all the pictures of these pups you guys are sending in. That QR code there you see on the upper right portion of your screen, you can scan that and use that to send in pictures to our KSAC Connect of your puppies or whatever else you got going on uh, weather-wise or what you, what you see outside. We appreciate them as always. Very quickly, forecast air quality today. It is on the, in the unhealthy category for those who are sensitive. We had that yesterday. The air has been a little bit stagnant with the ozone, so just a heads up there. Football forecast tonight. It uh, doesn't get much better than this. That's, it's, it's good, again. Uh, sunset is around 720. Kickoff uh, 85 degrees, but by halftime 77. I wouldn't say that's blanket weather yet. It might be for Sarah, but not for everyone else. And I think that uh, it'll be perfect for, for football, guys. Thank you, Justin. Blanket weather. I mean, I know I'm a bit of a wuss. You're very cold natured. Okay, yeah, I am a wuss. Yeah, I, I, was I, 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 another way to phrase yeah. that. I was going to say. I'm embracing it. Cold, I, anything, cold anything below 75, I'm pretty yeah, much a baby about. Yeah. So anyway. Um, <laughs> Right, college and high school football heating up in the fall. David is back. RJ has mm. returned to the studio today to break down this weekend's action, including what should be a, another fun Friday night. Ooh. This one for UTSA, right, guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is weird. UTSA <laughs> is. No, it is. I mean, you, normally college Friday football, night lights. like Thursday yeah. night, or then you know Saturday. they'll play on Saturday. And but tonight it's uh, Middle Tennessee and UTSA yeah. in 
with Breesboro. Yeah, we were trying to pronounce that earlier. Not even going to try again here, but the rare Friday night yeah, lights at, game for at UTSA. I, you know, they must have something to do later this weekend or something. I don't know what's going on there in Murfreesboro, but it's going to be a very interesting game. Mm -hmm. These two teams can put up some points. Oh, yeah. Just as an example, so far, Middle Tennessee, 44, 34, 49, and 45. UTSA, 37, 41, 41, and 52. Mm -hmm. So this will be one of those 10 to 7 games then. <laughs> Maybe by the first five minutes. And okay. then, uh, yeah, we'll see some more points here. Uh, Middle Tennessee, you mentioned, David, uh, putting up some points. Last week they beat Miami. That's mm. right, the U on the road. So uh, this is going to be a good game because these two teams have competed back and forth. Frank Harris last week set a school record for passing yards, 392 passing yards. And so Frank has been on a roll here. And I think if UTSA can get this win, get an extra day or two off, get yeah. a little bit of rest, because they are still trying to heal up from a pretty, pretty rough non-conference schedule so far. Yeah, it's been, and it's just such a short week, and you're hoping that their offensive line can finally get completely healthy and all those guys can come back, because Middle Tennessee is able to do a little pass rushing, plus they put some points on the board. And, you know, you got to wonder, was Miami just overlooking Middle Tennessee <laughs> last week, or is Middle Tennessee really that good? Ooh, I guess we'll we're going to find, find out. out tonight. Yeah, yeah, so, we will definitely find out. So, there, um, you go. So. there you go. Yeah, birds up there. Go Roadrunners. Hopefully yep. they could bring home a win. All right, David, Texas now. Texas coming Have off Have they that recovered? Huge, I see you wearing the tie. Huge <laughs> overtime loss to Texas Tech last week. I don't know if they can recover from this. You one. haven't let us forget it. This is going to be tough to recover from. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, they're, they're hosting Virginia. Virginia's not very good this year. Yeah. And they're playing at 630. They're, they're back to like everything's normal. It's not an early game. The uh -huh. question is, is uh, Ewers going to be back? Yeah. So uh, Quinn That's Ewers uh, earlier this week reportedly uh, still fe feeling a lot of pain in his shoulder. Uh, Hudson Card has been taking the first string snap still. So I don't know. I don't know. I, like you said, they got West Virginia here. Then they got the Red River Showdown, so maybe yeah. they hold Quinn out, try and get this win here with Hudson Card. But uh, that's going to be uh, – can't look past to OU I, yet. Got to take her business. I was going to say, they might hold him out, but they better not uh, hold up. They better go out and, <laughs> yeah. and get a win over Virginia. Something tells me that B.J. Robinson is not going to fumble the Apparently, tomorrow. he's been carrying the football all around yeah. campus. <laughs> he yeah. learned his left. After Remember, right he fumbled in, uh, the, uh, yeah. in the overtime against Tech, and that's how Tech mm -hmm. won, won it with that field goal. So <clears> oh, yeah. I got a feel, and I got a feeling that uh, you're going to see a, a lot of ground game, and you're going to see a lot of yards from, from those running backs for Texas because that's, that seems to be their, their strongest part of their and game at this point. is their running game right now. So, so. they play West Virginia or Virginia? Virginia. West Virginia. West, West Virginia. Virginia. Yes. Mountaineers. Okay. Big Thank 12. You. Big 12 yeah. game here. All right. The Aggies. The Aggies. Justin, go. who they got? Horn. Gig them. <laughs> who they got? Mississippi State. <laughs> and who's the head coach of Mississippi State? Mike Leach. Mike Leach. Former Texas Tech head coach, Mike Leach. Yes. There you go. I, you like the guy that A&M knows time. very well. Yeah. He's so, beat uh, us. This, this is going to be a, this is going to be an interesting yeah. game. Where are they playing, Justin? In Starkville. All right. So Stark Vegas, it's as road, it's called sometimes. Their tailgate scene is called Stark Vegas. It's a road nice. game. Yeah. Mississippi State's kind of been up and down a little bit this year. We know the Aggies have been up and down a little bit this year, but they're coming up a big win last week. The oink doink. The oink doink. David, as it's so, called, this missed field goal against the Arkansas Razorback. The oink doink yeah, and AM and survived this one. I still like to play in the end zone when the Arkansas quarterback <laughs> fumbled it and the Aggies picked it up and then handed it off and the guy ran, you know, hundred whatever. Oh, hundred. that play was incredible. That yeah, was, that was he just an pitched awesome it play. Back. So yeah, that was Aggies got a little momentum going. Mm -hmm. So they've uh, they got what, a couple of wins in a row there, Justin? Going into mm -hmm. this game, big SEC game. If you're going to have any chance mm -hmm. in the SEC, you got to win these kind of games right here on the road or at home. Sound cliche -ish enough for you? Yeah. <laughs> Mississippi State is favored just for Ah, that. okay. Uh, so, yeah, a and wow. beat yep. Miami a couple weeks ago, and then yep. they got this win here against Arkansas. So, yeah, a little bit on a roll here. Still need to see more from the offense from the Aggies here, but uh, this should be a fun one there in uh, Starkville. All right, and, of course, tonight, not only do we have UTSA at 630, but – it is a huge night in high school football because we've got some – they're have they already starting to play for playoff position in districts, yeah. believe it or not. What is this, like week six, right? Week six already. Wow, that already. is unbelievable. Almost, uh, basically it was just like yesterday we were doing the pig, Pigskin pig Classic. Pigskin Classic, yeah. Right? <laughs> so week six here, we got Brandeis taking on Johnson at Comalander Stadium, two of the top teams in the city, uh, two of the best quarterbacks in the city as well, Brandeis, J.C. Evans, Ty Hawkins for the Johnson Jaguars. And once again, a lot of the games will be live streamed tonight, so you can check out uh, your favorite team. So let's check go. that out. All right. Fantastic. So big, Great weather. Night, so. RJ, David, thank you guys. All right. right now, 941, 70 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. We'll be right back. 
Okay, tomorrow is October. That means it's spooky season. And while scary movies might be fun, one place you don't want to get any scares or surprises is on a flight. That's exactly what passengers on several American airline flights experienced when they heard moans and groans over the plane's PA system. However, as seen as Jeannie most reports, at least one, at least one passenger enjoyed the free in-flight entertainment. Fasten your seatbelt. Because this is not your captain speaking. Emerson Collins was a passenger on an American Airlines flight from Los Angeles to Dallas. The weird noises over the plane's PA system began before takeoff and continued on and off during the flight. It sounds like someone is struggling gastrointestinally or something. For Emerson's traveling co-worker, it was a WTF experience. Ladies and gentlemen, we realize there is an extremely irritating sound coming over the public announcement. None of us are enjoying it. I was like, it's not irritating to me. I'm finding it sort of hilarious. Theories ranged from, is someone hacking into American Airlines in-flight PA systems to planes haunted? Who you gonna call? <laughs> but wait, my wife and I experienced this during an American Airlines flight in July. Passengers on at least three flights heard moaning and screaming sounds over the PA. The captain comes on and says, there's no need to be concerned. This will not affect the flight controls, which is great. American Airlines put out a statement. The PA systems aboard our aircraft are hardwired and there is no external access. The airline said our maintenance team thoroughly inspected the aircraft and the PA system and determined the sounds were caused by a mechanical issue with the PA amplifier. Yeah, well, maybe it is some kind of bizarre feedback. But try telling that to the poster who whimsically theorized flying hurts the clouds and their screams are picked up by the PA system. Genimos, CNN. New York. Okay, two things. One... Is Emerson Collins not the best person to interview for this story? He was Thank so, goodness he was on the flight. He was Two, so great. Two, American, you got to prove to me you were able to duplicate those sounds with your faulty PA amplifier. Thank it just right. makes no sense. It really sounds like a man. So they were basically <laughs> saying there's no way we got hacked. That's what I, they were saying I in their think, statement. I think that makes they, sense. I but think they got hacked. Going on. Something. Yeah. I, and it happened on more than one, a one-off. Sure. Right. Yeah. Three flights. Something very going. weird. Yeah. Hmm. That sounds very much like a good practical joke there. All right. United and Delta, you have some catching up to do. <laughs> <laughs> Get some oh, free man. publicity. What a mm. crazy story, Justin. Spooky that moans. Sound. Okay. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> weird stuff, man. Can't make that up. Okay. Well, we are getting into uh, October, which is that uh, that time of year. So it is. It, you look at the the numbers. It's getting cooler. Our averages are 87 and 65 to start the month. By the time we end October, look at the average high, 77. The average low is 55. So we start to get more fronts in the month of October. They become a little more common. Although there are not any over the next seven days, that nothing really in extended that tells us a good front's coming through. But our temperatures are going to be pretty close to average next several days. Here's a look at the time lapse this morning. And yeah, we have clear skies. Uh, all day yesterday, we had it uh, through the night into today, and we're going to see clear skies through this afternoon. Things do change a little bit over the weekend with some cloud cover, but uh, nothing that's uh, going to bring us any rain, unfortunately. 67 at the airport right now, east northeasterly winds at about 6 miles per hour, and we look across the state, mainly 60s. Uh, it's uh, nice not only here, but for all of Texas and really a large portion of the country. Starting to see some 70s show up. 71 Pleasanton, 70 in Beeville, 71 right now in Uvalde. And the forecast side today will be up around 90 here in town. 89 Ferrox Ranch, 89 in Seguin, 90 in Floresville. This map looks pretty similar to the last uh, two or three days. Uh, so not much is changing here. And the weekend forecast looks pretty similar, although we bring down temperatures just a little bit on Sunday. Again, that's close to our average, right? 
Uh, more clouds are in the forecast, and that'll drag temperatures down just a little bit. Saturday, beautiful, 89 degrees, mostly sunny. Here's a look at Tropical Storm Arlene. You know, we've been focusing on in, and that is forecast to make landfall today as a Cat 1 storm a little bit later this afternoon, and we'll be keeping tabs on that. But there is a tropical storm in the Pacific, and that is Orlean. Uh, right now, winds are at 60 miles per hour, gusting to 70, and this is moving northwest at 5 miles per hour. It will uh, likely strengthen to a Category 2 storm and then weaken as it makes landfall near Mazatlan as a probably a, a tropical storm. But it'll uh, produce quite a bit of rain there along the coast of Mexico, the West Coast. And it will also bring in some cloud cover for us. So we'll be watching some high clouds that will be drifting in starting Saturday evening, although this shows most of Saturday is pretty quiet. But notice the clouds start to funnel in Sunday morning. And then by midday Sunday, the clouds are starting to thicken up a little bit. And that's that added cloud cover I was mentioning on Sunday that may bring temperatures down just a little bit. And that probably carries over right into Monday. And that really is about the only change in the forecast we can give you. Otherwise, it's pretty quiet stretch here. And, of course, the rainfall, the lack of rainfall, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. So the extended forecast here, we're going to go 89 on Saturday mostly sunny 87 on sunday mostly cloudy both sunday and monday and then partly cloudy skies much of next week and temperatures stay right there in the upper 80s with lows in the 60s we'll be right back hocus pocus 2 is finally available to watch on disney plus and there are two other new movies out today too abc's jason nathanson gives us a preview of these movies and tells us a little more about the new cast members to the beloved halloween classic I banish thee from Salem forever. There's a new generation of wannabe witches in Hocus Pocus 2. Whitney Peake, Belisa Escobedo, and Lily of Buckingham join Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy and Jimmy in the scary sequel. And Buckingham and Escobedo say the 90s original was a seasonal staple for them. It was one of the things that made me love Halloween in the first place, and it's my favorite holiday now. Uh, every Halloween we watched it. One of my mom's like all-time favorite Halloween movies. So I have just a lot of random memories of like sitting around a bunch of Halloween candy and pizza and watching the Sanderson sisters. Whitney Peak though, had never seen it before her audition. Hocus Pocus 2 is out today on Disney+. Plus. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Now I have to go to a Pride party and you're both too old to be in the pool. At the box office this weekend, one film to make you laugh, another to make you scream. Bros is a comedy from Billy Eichner, billed as the first rom-com about a gay couple from a major studio to open in theaters across the country. The worst smile I've ever seen. <laughs> and Smile is a supernatural thriller meant to leave you in tears, and it's expected to top the new releases with about 15 to $20 million, which is about what it costs to make. I'm Jason Nathanson, ABC News, Los Angeles. Don't forget the debate between Governor Greg Abbott and Beta O'Rourke is tonight at 7 o'clock. You can watch it live right here on KSAT and online at KSAT.com. Immigration, abortion, the economy, and guns are expected to be a major topic of conversation. Abbott's campaign says this will be the only debate he will be doing before Election Day. Steve Spreester is one of the panelists for the debate, which is expected to last about an hour. And overall, pretty good weekend, right? Great weekend. Really nice. Temperatures will be very comfortable. Thank you, Justin. Yep. Have an awesome weekend as well. Our team is back at noon. We'll see you then.